um, week two of the, the difficult part of Romans. Um, I'm sure as you read that, you also realized that <laughs> we're not in for, a, for an, easy, an easy discussion this afternoon. So let me pray one more time. Ask God to help us with this. Father, your word is life to us. And we pray that we would see that as such today. That your spirit would take your word and make it real to us. Convict those of us who need conviction. Comfort those who need comfort. And speak to us and grow us. In Jesus' name. Amen. So last week I mentioned to you that for many of us who became Christians later in life, Romans 1, 18 to 31, the passage we spoke on last week, rang so true to us. When we read that, we could say, this is me suppressing the truth about God, letting that shape my life, and my life at that point was far removed from God. If that was you, we were the prodigal sons and daughters And I mentioned to you how seeing myself in those verses made me very aware of the fact that I was not who God had made me to be, and I was nowhere near where He wanted me to be. Now, I've said this to some of you, and after today, all of you, but Romans was key to my conversion. In fact, it was in reading chapters 1 to 3 that I was gripped by my need for Christ. And I say chapters 1 to 3 because... After the discomfort that chapter 1 brought, this section that Pete just read was the one that I found the most challenging. Because you see, while I could see myself and my attitude towards God and some of my actions in the verses before, very quickly, like the minute after I'd gone, sure, that is me, in my head and my heart, I could start making excuses for myself. Yeah, sure, I went out on Friday nights and did ABC, but I didn't do X, Y, Z. Surely that made me better. Or uh, I treated people with disdain for their feelings, but I didn't resort to violence, so surely I was better. Those guys are much more trouble with God than I am, aren't they? There was always someone else I could judge as worse than me. Until I read this section. What makes Romans 2, verse 1 to 16, so uncomfortable right from the start is that it turns the pointing finger back at me. I, you know some expressions you really just really hate? I hate that expression if you point a finger, three are pointing back at you. Don't know why, it's this unreasonable hatred of an expression. But it's true. Where last week's section speaks about people, you know, the people out there doing X, Y, and Z. Paul changes his language here in chapter 2 and says, you, and from verse 1, the you is singular. Who, me? Yes, you, you there nodding your head because you know so many people who are bad there in chapter 1 and do bad things, and as you read it, you're secretly thinking, "Mm -mm -mm, but God is going to sort you out, buddy. You. You are no better. And you are no better off. And that's the end of verse verse 1 there. Every one of you who judges is without excuse, for when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you who judge do the same things. Now, you'll have seen in the reading that this section is about judging and justice and the day of God's wrath. You know, last week we saw how God in His current, present, ongoing wrath lets us act as if we're in charge. He he kind of lets us do what we want. But today we're pointed forward to a day where God will enact final judgment, a day when his wrath, which remember his wrath is, um, next slide there, Leon, his holy hostility towards evil and his just judgment upon it, that day when his wrath will have out. And we're actually forced to compare our justice and God's justice and our means of judgment and God's means of judgment, which we're going to have to do, be shown the uncomfortable reality of our hearts and hopefully do what this section is intended for us to do which is to repent where necessary, and I think be grateful in all cases. But first, we need to be clear about what we mean by judging or judgment. Does it mean that we can't express disapproval? Does it mean we can't say, well, I think that is wrong? No, 
Last week, we actually saw certain ways of life and attitudes of the heart that the Bible says are wrong. In, in fact, in 1 Corinthians, another letter, Paul writes, there's a man in the church sleeping with his father's wife, and the church are told to judge him. So obviously, there's a way in which we can judge. But when Paul criticizes the judging people here, and when Jesus does as well, when he says, do not judge, they're talking about an attitude that writes the person off, that is kind of like a final and last judgment on the person that says, uh, you're a worthless end of story, or you are never going to make it to heaven, or you are just bad, final. There's that finality of the statement in which you put yourself in the place of judge and jury. That's what he's talking about here. We sit in judgment, not when we disagree or when we say something is wrong, but when we say it like our final judgment is the one which really matters. Like because I've said it, it's finished in class. That kind of judgment belongs to God, right? Now there's two differences in this passage between our judgment and God's, and which shows us why we, why we shouldn't do it. So we judge without knowing the facts. God judges truthfully. We judge with partiality. God shows no favoritism. So let's have a look at us first, at the you. Um, I saw a link to a podcast a few weeks ago. Um, it was definitely clickbait. You know, they put a statement of the podcast next to the guy's picture, and it was so immediately offensive, even to me, that my back was up, and I was ready to judge the man who had obviously said it, because it was in inverted commas next to his face. I was ready to judge him, as just a jerk. But I listened to the podcast, and while he had said that line, it was much gentler when listened to in the whole context of those 15 minutes. While I still didn't agree with him, his logical flow in the entire talk made me see where he was coming from, and I could go, I disagree with you, but I, I don't think you're as big a, a jerk as what I thought you were in the beginning. Actually, it was probably me who was being jerky. And I thought of that podcast and realized, you know, we are bombarded with noise all the time. Whether you are on social media or not, most of your friends are, and they will tell you what's going on. You will hear things that are happening in your neighborhood, in your city, in your country, in the world, on the internet, News 24, TV, radio, podcasts, Facebook, blah, 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 everywhere. And you're expected to deal with it. You're expected to make something of it. And, 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 and that's the problem. Each of us is expected to have a judgment on these topics, an opinion on these topics. You know, two years ago, two years ago, a man was killed in America. And within 12 hours, I was asked what my, what my thoughts on Black Lives Matter movement was. I didn't know what the Black Lives Matter movement was. How could I have a thought on it? You know, you thought at the moment, you, you, you asked at the moment, what do you think of Mark Boucher and Cricket South Africa's case? I don't know Mark Boucher's case and Cricket South Africa. I don't know. What do you think of, insert hot point, hot, hot point here? Now, be realistic. What do I know about these things? What can I know about these things? I know what the media tells me. I know what I read or what I listen to. And let's be fair, we read and listen to a very small amount of the information that is out there. And if I haven't read anything or discussed anything with anyone else, why should I have a thought on those things? Why do I need to have a judgment on everything that's going on in the world at the moment? My judgment on it will be flawed at best, probably miss a chunk of detail and information and fact. And yet, you and I are asked for opinions. We're asked to make judgments on things every single day. The sad reality is, we're often very happy to. And yet we never judge, I never judge with the whole truth. I'm going to say I here, so that we're thinking in the second person singularly. You know, the you, I, so think I with me. I never judge with the whole truth. In verse 2 we read that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth. And part of what Paul is getting here at here is that 
you and I are not like that. God bases His judgments on the truth. We don't. Not always, at least. Why? Because we don't know the full facts. We can't know the full facts. Um, one of the reasons I'm so, um, I'm so happy we partner with the Homeless Ministries of Life Changes is because I am so often quick to judge the guys at the traffic lights. I look at him, my heart is hard, and I say, look at that oak, druggy. And I have a hard heart, I feel no kindness towards him, and I kind of just drive off. But what do I know about that man or woman? I know absolutely zero. I know they live on the street. That's it. I don't know what happened to them. I don't know whether they were abused by their parents and they had to run away from home and the only place they found love and acceptance was with the other people who lived on the street. I don't know that. And yet I make a judgment call. What makes me think I know enough to judge whether that person is worthy or not of even my kindness or my smile? I don't. We judge people based on 140 character tweets or on photos on Instagram or in a one-minute clip taken out of a half-an-hour talk or a 45-minute talk. We cancel people who hold different political views than we do, even when we haven't bothered to research the political view or why they hold it. We don't judge others truthfully. But if we look at verse 2, good news is that God does. And we'll get back to that just now. We also don't judge people impartially. We have inbuilt prejudices, which mean that our judgments are pretty much always biased. We tend towards thinking the worst of other people. I, I don't like saying this about myself. I'm not sure if you're going to like thinking about it for yourself, but, but we do. So think of this range of stuff. Number one, guys, you might remember, when Richie McCaw, captain of the All Blacks and flanker, would come around the side of the scrum again and again and again, and the referee would never call him out on it, we'd shout at the ref and go, come on, those cheating filthy All Blacks! Rawr! But when a Springbok did it, he'd kind of giggle a little bit and go, lucky he got away with it, eh? A child at school is suspended for bad behavior. If it's another person's child, his parents are obviously not doing a great job. Can't be a great home. If it's my child, shame my poor baby. Can't be a bad home. I mean, it's my home. We judge generationally. Young people these days, whew, either their music choices stink or we call them names like snowflake entitled millennial, I don't know what else, or whatever other phrases go around, and it goes the other way as well. We judge culturally. I, I remember, I think, one thing from my uh, psych uh, course in first year university, and that was this video we watched. Videos were around back then. Um, and, and there was a Pacific, I, I studied in New Zealand, and it was a video of a job interview, and uh, a white employer was interviewing a Pacific Island employ potential employee. And they're just talking about cultural differences. So in the white culture, when you greet someone, you shake their hands, you look them in the eye. It's like trustworthiness, etc. And in the Pacific Island culture, when you greet someone who you are respecting or deferential to, you drop your eyes, because that's a sign of respect. In the white culture, it's a sign that that guy's shifty, and you don't want to hire him. And so you, you see that culturally, all these different practices, like if I drop my eyes out of respect, the other guy's going, oh, I don't want to hire this guy, he's got something to hide. We judge without knowing the full truth. We're not impartial. I had something about South Africans and cultural judging in here, but I'll, I think let's leave that out, because I think we're all aware of the kind of judging that we do culturally here. We will be strong on passages that condemn homosexuality, like last week's, but miss the passage just above it that condemns other sexual impurity, adultery, pornography, all that kind of stuff. It's because we're inclined to be partial towards ourselves. We will always go easy on ourselves and we'll be super hard on people. That's just generally how we work. 
And this is especially the case for those of us who base our value on our morals, on our performance in life based on the standards that we have set ourselves. Whether or not we believe in God or think that God is unnecessary to be good, which is often an argument people make, when we become the judge of what is right and what is wrong and how we should live, we will base everyone or we will judge everyone else based on those standards and we will look down on those who we think don't make the grade. Now, that was part of my thinking. I knew I wasn't perfect, but surely I wasn't that bad. I excused my failures and judged others harshly for the same things. I say that was me, that is often still me. But the thing is, everyone who passes this judgment is without excuse because if by our own standards, let alone God's standards, we fall short. And this is actually why God's judgment, different to ours, is a wonderfully fantastic thing. I wonder if you noticed at the end of verse 16, we read that God's judgment is part of the good news. It's part of the gospel. Have a look at that. When God judge, the, the day when God judges what people have kept secret according to my gospel through Christ Jesus. God's judgment is part of the good news of Christianity. Why? Well, firstly, because God's judgment will be based on the truth. That's there in verse 2. We saw that. It's also in verse 6. He will repay each one according to his works. Even as verse 16 says, he will judge our secrets. The things we hope no one else will find out. He, his final judgment will be one that takes into account everything you and I have thought, said, and done. Which means that he will know whether you stole that bread because your family was starving when maybe the rest of us looked at it and went, you're just dodging. He will know those things. And in that sense, it will be truthful and it will be righteous. I feel we just have to quickly look at verses 7 and 8. It says, uh, verse 6 says, um, He will repay each one according to his works, eternal life to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, but wrath and anger to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth while obeying unrighteousness. I think in these two verses, Paul is trying to help people see that you too are not righteous, even if you think you are better than others. So this, these verses, while saying that you can be righteous if you are perfect, is trying to help you realize that you can never be someone who persists in seeking good. You're never someone who is never self-seeking. There's always going to be an element of selfishness in you. And God will have seen that. He'll know that, and his righteous judgment will be based on every thought and word and deed. Which is great, actually, because we will all be judged by the same standards. That's the second thing about God's judgment. It's impartial. No difference for black or white, or male or female, or Jew and Greek. So you actually see that in verse 9 and, and um, 10 already. They, they are repeats of verses 7 and 8, but with the extra detail of first Jew, but also the Greek. It's Paul introducing the next section, verses 12 to 16, and the idea that God shows no favoritism. So think back to your response to that rugby game and the actions of the other team versus your team. That's favoritism, right? God won't do that. And Paul explains it in this section from verses 12 to 15. Have a quick peek here. He says, For all who sin without the law will also perish without the law. All who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For the hearers of the law are not righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So when Gentiles, who do not by nature have the law, do what the law demands, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Their consciences confirm this. Their competing thoughts either accuse or even excuse them. What Paul is saying here is that the person who has never heard the law of Moses, the person who's never heard the Ten Commandments, will not be judged for not having kept them. The person who has never heard of Jesus will not be judged for rejecting Jesus. God will judge us all according to what we know. It will not be unfair. Especially since most people, at least the people Paul is speaking to here, have a conscience. You know, the reason do not murder is often in most so-called civilized societies throughout the eons an accepted rule 
is because the law of God is still there to some degree in our hearts. We don't always suppress the truth so much that we forget everything. So when Gentiles, not all of them, but some who do not by nature have the law, do what the law demands, they're a law to themselves. In other words, they show themselves to understand enough to be accused or excused, as Paul says. God is not going to be partial. He will be fair. He will judge rightly. I was thinking this week about our country's uh, next chief justice and the legal system. Chatting to an anonymous friend who is in the legal system. He said that the most difficult thing about working there is that there is still uncertainty. You can prepare all you want, have all the right stuff ready, but there is still subjectivity in the process. There's no guarantee that the judge won't have a bad day or he just won't like your face. Or that he just hasn't considered everything the way you have. As good as our judges are, and credit to them, they're fantastic, they're still people, they're still flawed, they're still fallible. God isn't. His judgment will be objective, just, truthful, impartial, fair. That's good news. Moreover, a couple of things to be said about God and His judgment from this passage. Two more things. Number one, or number three on there. It's God's kindness that this, this passage is here and that these warnings are here. Have a look at verses 4 to 5. Or do you despise the riches of His kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is, is intended to lead you to repentance? Because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. Those words, hardened and unrepentant, uh, when the Old Testament was initially or firstly translated from Hebrew into Greek, those were the words that were used for idolatry. A clear indication that you can view your own goodness or your own perceived righteousness as your savior. Thanks, Lee. And this is God's warning. His kind warning that you need to repent of that. Because even by your own standards, if you haven't used God's, you will still fall short. And you can judge others as harshly as you like. It still won't make you perfect. It won't make you righteous. In fact, it will make you more culpable, as the Paul says at the end of verse 5. So if that is you here today, having the standard of morality that you think is what makes you good, and judging others according to that, this is your chance to repent. In other words, say sorry to God that you feel that you are good enough for Him. And admit that you aren't. The righteousness of God that you think you can get by yourself for yourself, we read in chapter 1, is found only through faith in Jesus. And repentance is literally saying, I'm going to stop trusting in myself, I'm going to turn around, and I'm going to start trusting that righteousness is through Christ. It's God's kindness. And the last thing to see is that God's judge is also God's savior. So I put the ESV, not our Pew Bible one in there, the ESV and the NIV of verse 16 is actually um, helpful. It says, on that day when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. God's judge is also God's savior, Jesus. God will judge people through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who, picture this, will be seated in front of you as the books are opened. Revelation says the books will be opened. Your book will be opened. The book containing all of your thoughts and words and deeds will be opened and laid bare. And the righteousness and impartiality of God that we've spoken about, that will be Christ's, God the Son's. As He looks over all the detail and judges you fairly, and you'll have those stamps, this is my picture of it, next to the book. And for all of you who trust in his death, he will pick up a stamp. And as he slams the stamp down on that book, full of your misdeeds, full of your self-righteousness, it won't read guilty and condemned. It will read paid for. 
already paid, account settled, whatever the right terminology there is, done. That's the promise. Christ's death has paid for your sins and for your unloving hearts. And if you haven't trusted in that yet, that is how you will be seen as righteous by God. You know, it might not sound like God's judgment is good news, but you and I need to take hold of these chapters of Romans and understand our natural state before God. Either we're all out prodigal sons and daughters, you know, going wild, or else we're the self-righteous older son. If you know the parable, at the end of the parable, he stays outside because he's just too proud of his own good works. He says, that younger son of yours was useless. I've stayed here all this time. I've worked really hard for you. I've been great. One British preacher said, we are all on very good terms with ourselves. We can always put up a good case for ourselves. And as I said to you, that was me. I felt I was good enough for God because I had a code that I generally kept. You know Elsa's codes they generally keep to? Gangsters. You know, they'll kill their opponents. They'll sell drugs to kids. They will beat their wives. But they're always very respectful to their mothers. Always with this code of conduct, which you, the things you do and don't do as a gangster. And if you do them, then you're out of here as well. And God warns us so strongly of that kind of hypocrisy here. Because while the younger prodigal son literally came to his senses and went back to the father, the self-righteous older son didn't. He was outside of the feast at the end of the parable. We are so blind to our own idol of morality. And I'm, I'm begging with you as I beg with me this week, think very carefully if that's you or not. But there'll be some of you sitting here, and this is the last word, who have very sensitive consciences. You're Christians, you've trusted in Jesus, and you read this passage and you want to pull your hair out and wear sackcloth. Because you, you, you do have sensitive hearts. God's chosen judge is also God's chosen savior. The judge is your savior. More than that, the judge is the one who, as we saw this week in our growth group study, said, come to me, all you are burdened and weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, he says. You know, in Christian sin, we feel as if Jesus is sitting inside the kitchen with a wooden spoon, tapping on his leg, waiting for us. Not that that's a scene from our house. Um, and he's ready to berate and tut, tut, tut our mistakes. And we burden ourselves. We kind of go, he doesn't want me. Come to me, he says. He doesn't draw away from you, but his very heart is inclined to forgive you and reach out for you, and pull you in. And he does so, knowing that your sins are forgiven, for he died for them. Why wait outside the door? Yes, Christ hates your sin, but Christ loves you. He might discipline you, but that's a loving thing. Parents, we know that. But while Christ hates your sin, Christ loves you. That's why the cross happened. The wrath of God against sin poured out on Jesus. Why? Because he loves you. So you don't have to hide from him. You don't have to feel like he won't want you. Why will he not want you now when he's done that for you? He knows. He knows everything. He will judge truthfully, so bring it to him. Say sorry, repent, and you will find a Savior who is quick to forgive, quick to open his arms to you and welcome you back. Your judge is your Savior. And that is wonderful, wonderful news. Maybe you want to take some time and speak to him yourself now. 